Please have your Bibles open to John 4. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word of truth. We pray that you would pour out your spirit freshly now that we might see more of who you are and what you're doing and where we fit. To your glory. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. She lived in a world of charcoal grey skies. Like, you know, the darkness before dawn, but the sun never rose. She was alone so often in her thoughts and her mind would have been just churning over every sad happening, every unrealised dream. She tried to convince herself of how good things could have been if only there weren't so many hateful people that she had to deal with. She avoided the stares of people all around her, her neighbours, and in quiet desperation just relived the events and re-argued her cases, trying to comfort herself, trying to vindicate herself. The trouble was no one was listening and her life was just seeping away like hot sand through your fingers. She hadn't planned to see anyone that day as she went to the well. Experience taught her when to go for water so that she could avoid harsh glares, painful conversations. He planned to rest while his disciples went up to the village to get something to eat. And what better place to rest at noon than a cool well? No one comes for water then. He can take it quietly for a bit. But he saw her trudging up with a heavy jar on her shoulder and she didn't really have to say anything. Her life story would have been written on her face. The wounds of five broken romances gaped and festered. Each man she had lost had taken a piece of her heart. Life takers. And now she was probably unsure if she had anything left. And the man you now live with won't commit to you. Jesus said it for her. He understood her pain too well. Far more than five men had broken their commitments to him already and so many more he knew would break their vows to him in the future. And so here, silently, quietly, in a very understated way, the life giver reached into his kit for his needle of grace and his thread of hope And in the cool of Jacob's well, he stitched her broken spirit back together. He spoke healing words. The hour is coming when what you called won't matter. The Father seeks those who worship him in spirit and in truth. No one would have blamed Jesus for ignoring the woman. He's at the well and not going up to the village, it seems, to avoid people. But I'm sure in his all-knowing position, he didn't want to avoid her. No one would have blamed Jesus for ignoring her, certainly. And if it had been me, I absolutely would have ignored her or maybe just said a curt, g'day. I'm sure that's the way we would tend to operate. But here is Jesus. He takes risks with people, doesn't he? He takes risks with ordinary people such as you and me. And he is God who made her and he was not going to avoid her. He was not. He couldn't do that. So here she came down the hill a child of Adam's race, thinking only of ordinary water, a very ordinary need. And she met the second Adam, 
Jesus, who filled her with a desire for a life more than she had ever dreamed of. He raised her vision. He revealed himself to her as the life giver. God is the life giver for all people. This is the true universalism of the Bible, you know. Not that all people will be saved, but that all types of people will be saved. You won't be barred from God's presence and joyful life because of your gender, your intellect, your education, race, your nationality, your wealth or your social position. And this simplicity is the glory of God's grace. John 4 vividly illustrates this principle. But to understand what's going on here, you really need to do a bit of work in the context and read back a bit. At the end of chapter 2, which is where we were last time, chapter 2 into the beginning of chapter 3, but at the end of chapter 2, if you read it there, it might be even on the same page in your Bibles, verses 24 and 25, it says but Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all men he didn't need man's testimony about man for he knew what was in a man Radio. that's the end of John 2 the next verse is John chapter 3 verse 1 famous verse now there was a man of the Pharisees You see what's going on. This man was named Nicodemus and this man came to Jesus by night. So you see, John is introducing the idea of what humanity is like and then Nicodemus comes along as John's first great example of the human race representing the finest human qualities. And in chapter 3 he's introduced to show our need for the amazing news about Jesus Christ. And he provides a context for Jesus explaining what it means to be born again. The famous passage in John 3, which we looked at last time. But don't think that Nicodemus was the only one who needed the good news. John 3.16 famously says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And each side of John 3.16, you get encounters with diverse people to illustrate the truth that the world means every type of person and every background of person and to grasp this truth more deeply we're brought to John's second example the unnamed woman at the well in Samaria this woman she had a bad reputation if we're to judge by the fact that she came to draw water in the middle of the day I don't want to read too much into that, but it seems like it. Particularly other women wouldn't be there at that time. She came only for water, but she met Jesus. And he spoke to her and gave her the water of life. Very different. It's a gift that she had never dreamed of, but that completely satisfied her most important, deepest need. Her thirst for God. And this account closes with the witness of the woman to others from her town with the result that many of them also believed on Jesus, confessing he was the Messiah, their Saviour, the Saviour of the world. You see how all of this links together. And we tend to just read Bible, our Bibles chapter by chapter, and if we do that we would miss what's going on here in this broader section of John's Gospel. So I've just brought it right to the surface for us now. And it's hard to imagine a greater personal contrast than between Nicodemus and this unnamed woman. And you can see it up there and I'll go over it quickly. You've got important, sophisticated Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews versus a simple Samaritan woman. He was a male Jew. She was a female Samaritan. Though neighbours, they hated each other. He was a Pharisee. She belonged to no religious party. 
He was a politician, she was low status. He was a scholar, she wasn't. He was highly moral, she was outwardly at least immoral. He had a name, she remains nameless. He came at night to protect his reputation. She, who had no reputation, came at noon. Nicodemus came seeking. Oh yes, I am seeking. The woman, she was sought by Jesus. Nicodemus began the conversation while she avoided the conversation which Jesus began. You see how John seems very clearly to have put these two here and to describe them the way that he does to draw this out. So you see the contrast. Yet despite how different they are, both needed to hear Jesus and to bow to him. Both needed to come face to face, heart to heart, with the Lord of all. And if Nicodemus is an example of the truth that no one can rise too high so as to be above salvation and their need for it, the woman is an example, surely, that no one can go too low. So it's no accident that John places these wonderful encounters together early in his Gospel and they end, I repeat, with the Samaritan's statement that this is indeed the Saviour of the world. So, I ask the question, do you know this Jesus the way they describe him as your Saviour? Very easy to just go through the motions of a religious life like both this Pharisee and this woman had done. Thinking, going pretty well, going okay. You need it as much as the respected Nicodemus or the woman did. The fact that Nicodemus and the woman were so different actually reinforces this. But if we think more, we should move from those differences to the similarities and focus on those for a while. And if we do, I think we'll see that their similarities are maybe even more important than their differences. So what did they have in common? Well, they both thought they were okay spiritually. Mm. Really, honestly, if you think about it. Yes, there was an inner hunger in each, I'll delve into that later. But in their minds and maybe in their entire outlook of life, each thought that he or she was basically okay. Nicodemus thought so because of his religious and intellectual achievements. The woman, why? Because of her religious superstitions and traditions. They both somehow thought we're okay. And sure, other people might be different, but we're okay. And that's why I think we see it amongst people today because it's innately, deeply human. Every one of us wants to think we're okay because we are self-absorbed. Every single person who's ever lived other than Jesus. So what we're saying is everyone thinks we're okay by our own standards. This is true for the way people live today. Our own self-satisfied society. So long as you don't think too much about it, then you will think that you're okay. And having so many smart devices to keep us occupied means you're not going to think long. If you've got a moment actually where nothing's happening, you tune into this and that will absorb you all over again, and you don't have to think. That's the way most people live. And it's why at most funerals there are all these platitudes about, oh, they've gone to a better place, even if they've had nothing to do with Jesus except for as a swear word. And people talk as if, we will meet them again. It's a common human trait. Is that how you think? And if so, think again. Second, both Nicodemus and the woman were crudely literal or materialistic in their reaction to Jesus' spiritual teaching. In each situation, Jesus taught about the need for receiving new life from him. 
But when he spoke of it to Nicodemus using the image of new birth, all he could think of was obstetrics. He just didn't get it, did he? For the woman, when he spoke to her about receiving his living water, she thought only in terms of the great distance between the village and the well and how, well, I won't have to carry a heavy water pot anymore. That's good. Their reactions proved the truth of what the Apostle Paul said, and I've got it up there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, they're not able to, cannot. It's an ability which they do not have. Sadly, in their naturalistic reaction to Christ's teaching, Nicodemus and the woman are like men and women of all ages, and especially those of our own materialistic age. You think about our society and how it operates. Today, people like David Attenborough cynically say things like this. Hasn't science shown beyond all doubt that we live in a closed system? And therefore there's no God and we have no need of God. The aspects of human behaviour that used to be called religious are really only a projection of family relationships and therefore entirely explainable in terms of psychology. In fact, religion itself is merely a primitive attempt to give meaning to the data of human uh, experience, a task which has now been achieved much more completely through scientific investigation and discovery. There it is. There's the fist in the face of Jesus Christ. It's a crude and thoughtless way that the new atheists such as Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens attack Christianity. So many anti-Christian posts in popular media and tweets, they're, they're full of this sort of stuff and it's not well thought out at all. People like that, what they're really doing, they are limiting reality to what the five senses can grasp. The academic word for that is materialism. In fact, one of the buzzes in academia in the last few years has been the so-called new materialism. But it's the same old lie of Satan with new camouflage to disguise the nakedness of it all. You see, as a result of that blinkered worldview, the most important terms of life and indeed of Christianity become meaningless. You see, these people, they speak of assured truths when any realistic assessment of human knowledge would have to admit that There aren't assured truths in science. Let's just think of a science textbook of, say, 50 years ago. Some of you may remember vaguely then. I'm remembering a little bit less. But I would contend if you got that science textbook out today, there'd be quite a few things you'd put a red line through because of the way things have changed in the theories and the new discoveries which proved actually that was a bit wrong, or maybe totally wrong. But, you know, you don't hear those admissions from the scientific fraternity because so many of them are actually engaged in materialism themselves and scientism, not true observational science, sad to say. It's the same old lie of Satan with new camouflage to disguise its nakedness. What Dawkins regards as certain today, I'm sure will have many holes torn in it in 50 years' time. And he has no way, for instance, of explaining how humans everywhere agree on what a beautiful sunset is. And we'll agree about that in 50 years' time. But he has, with his crude, materialistic categories, No way of describing, explaining, working through that. He has a deep problem, but he won't admit it. And materialists like Nicodemus, the woman, 
Attenborough, Dawkins, completely miss what is most important, most vital for human flourishing, what it means to be truly, spiritually alive. And it follows from this that the 21st century materialist, just as certainly as the 1st century materialist who we're reading about in John 3 and 4, needs to meet this Jesus Christ and come to know the supernatural basis and reality of the Christian faith. Because authentic Christianity is supernatural. It isn't a tame, harmless ethic consisting of a few moral rules from which you can pick and choose, spiced with maybe a dash of blind faith. It isn't like that at all. It's a resurrection in time and space. It's a resurrection life, a life given by God and empowered by His Spirit. You're talking about completely different things here. Is it any wonder that often when you see debates between Dawkins and Ravi Zacharias and people like that, they're talking talking at cross purposes. And I'm intrigued that so often at the end of those debates, both sides claim they've won, sadly because they're talking in different spaces. And that's the way our world is right now. There's a lack of recognition of this. So, third, Nicodemus and the woman, they had in common the fact that they, like all men and women, were dead, empty spiritually, and thus they sensed somehow a need for God. Even though their outlook on life and their intellectual convictions were also denying it. Mentally and internally, They were at loggerheads in themselves. And so they were very messed up. Do you sense this need? I see it around in people all the time. There's some sort of acknowledgement of spiritual things, but they'll go people will go searching for answers in all sorts of weird places, from uh, spiritualist meetings to maybe some other temple on a mountain or whatever. I heard on the radio last night of some people who have, they say, oh, we're not religious, but they've done the, um, what's it called, the uh, Compostella uh, walk, 1,200 kilometres or so, twice. Husband and wife have done it twice. Oh, because it's spiritual. And um, here, giving some of my background, look, I love, I just love the harmonies of the Bee Gees. Robin Gibbs' voice, brilliant, and so on. Um, Especially their earlier stuff and their later stuff. Don't so much like Barry's falsetto. But Barry Gibb, with his latest album, he's got some very interesting songs on it. And in an interview, he says, well the music is my spirituality and I'm so saddened for him for that. You see, people understand there's this need but they're suppressing it at the same time. You need to sense the need and realise it can only be sorted out. It can only be filled in Jesus. Many know and tell it even though they don't know exactly what they need or long for and it's up to us as Christians to let people know that he is the saviour of the world. I'll give some other examples which maybe some more of you are aware of. Sinclair Lewis won a Pulitzer Prize many years ago for literature, mainly for one book. It was about a respectable businessman who left his family, went off with a girl who he thinks he loves And she tells him, on the surface we seem quite different, but deep down we are fundamentally the same. We are both desperately unhappy about something and we don't know what it is. Now, the woman at the well could have said that to Nicodemus. Many women could say it to their husbands, sadly. Many men to their wives. What is this longing? Augustine probably said it best, and you've probably heard this before, when he confessed to God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Great book to read. In modern language, if you can get it, Augustine's Confession. 
And then finally, Nicodemus and the woman had in common the fact that they were lost spiritually. That is, in the words of the Apostle Paul, they had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They were dead in trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You see, this was the root of all their other problems and was their most significant similarity. According to God, mankind has willfully abandoned him. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We've rejected God's law, spurned his calls of love, refused his direction, and laughed when he rebukes or brings judgment in any way. We've become worse than beasts in our relationship with our Creator. In our language, we speak of animal characteristics in people and call someone maybe who's obstinate, a mule, or dogged, or pig-headed. But God tells us that this insults his created animals because they're doing what they're created to do. And we don't. For instance, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. For the Lord has spoken, I have nourished and brought up my children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but my people do not know, my people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. You have forsaken the Lord. Could you get stronger language than that? So, here's the real crux for us. What can you do when you're lost? You need to find a way back. But what can you do if you can't find it? Because you're blind. You don't have eyes to see. Well, you need someone to restore your sight, don't you? And what can you do if you're actually spiritually dead? Moulder in the grave. Rot. Ah, What can you do? Well, you need someone to give you life, a saviour. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to save a fallen, rebellious race. A race of people like Nicodemus, like the woman of Samaria, you and me. He came to bring us all home to God, our Heavenly Father. He made the way by his death on the cross. And Jesus died to bear all the judgment and wrath of God that should have fallen on his people because of our sin. And he rose again as the life giver of all people all his people. So, my question to you is, have you come to him? Will you come to him? There's no other way. The Bible says that all God's blessing and getting right with God, which is by faith in Jesus, is offered to all. That is the true universalism of Christianity. But it comes only to all who believe. So come to him by faith.